family, tonight at 10. Tonight on 1986, Americans are being asked to take drug tests to combat drug abuse. This is leading to what I consider to be the next epidemic in America, which has already started, and that's test abuse. What you do off the job is your business. You come on the job, and then it's our business. A policeman shoots and kills his ex-girlfriend, but today, he's a free man. Do you think Ray Fassinger got away with murder? Yes. <laughs> For heart attack victims, it's the next best thing to a miracle. The doctor explained to me that they had a new drug. All right, free the way. Your heart's normal, okay? I think uh, of TPA uh, in the treatment of heart attacks, analogous to the development of penicillin in the treatment of infections. Good evening. This is the September 30th edition of 1986. I'm Roger Mudd. And I'm Connie Chung. Today, all of us seem to agree. Drug abuse is a plague, and it must be eradicated. It's hard to remember a time when the nation's focus was so clear. Led by the President and the First Lady, America is poised on the edge of an all-out effort to cleanse its citizens of drugs. In government, in amateur and professional sports, in business, drug testing is becoming the order of the day. No one faults the purpose, but especially where testing is concerned, there are serious questions about the means. To be free of drug abuse, yes, but as Ed Rabel's report asks, at what price? I was taken from my family. I was put in two different kinds of facilities for a total of 30 days, day and night. It was like being in the mental ward of another hospital. Uh, I had roommates that were addicts. One of them had tried to commit suicide, so his wrists were bleeding. Uh, one guy screamed in the middle of the night all the time. I didn't have any direction. I mean, I was just, I was, my nerves were shot, and I was so angry. They were scared that I could do something if I go back to work. If an individual doesn't want to stay, he can leave. If I left, I was fired. The nightmare Alan Pettigrew just described was his time in drug rehabilitation facilities. He was there because his employer, the Southern Pacific Railroad, said it was either that or be fired, a decision based on a surprise urine test for drugs the company had ordered him to take. Pettigrew is a computer specialist for Southern Pacific, and Bob Taggart is one of his superiors. What you do off the job is your business. You come on the job then it's our business and we've got the right to require as a condition of your employment that you come on the job drug free but Pettigrew says he was drug free he had no drugs in his possession he says he does not use illegal drugs still Pettigrew's problems began when Southern Pacific ordered him and other employees to take the test the test found that he was in violation of a company rule that prohibited an individual from reporting for work with drugs in his system in Allen's case cocaine I inform him that I don't use drugs. There's got to be a mistake somewhere. So, Pettigrew and his lawyer, Richard Donello, are suing Southern Pacific for $53 million in the dispute over the company's drug testing program. The primary issue is invasion of privacy. Well, we maintain that uh, where you're walking to work, you're not given any notice. You're told to drop your pants and you're, you're to give a part of your body, your anatomy, for testing purposes. We maintain that's an invasion of people's privacy company hires people to do a job. If people aren't doing the right job, you fire them or you send them home. If they come in stoned or drunk, you can tell if they're not doing the proper thing. But you don't uh, demean them and force them to uh, waive all constitutional rights uh, in the process. I was instructed by the management of Southern Pacific to sign a letter saying that I would submit to further random testing and would attend Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, and an aftercare meeting each week for a full year. 
That's when Pettigrew, um, saying enough is enough, filed his lawsuit. Southern Pacific, he says, again threatened to fire him, but his union intervened. Nevertheless, the company demoted him and cut his annual pay by $12,000. Alan Pettigrew's court case may take years to resolve. In the meantime, corporate America is high on drug testing. A third of the largest companies already have drug screening programs in place. So if you're an employee or are looking for work, chances are someone may demand that you too take a surprise drug test, no matter how inconvenient it may be. Just ask Southern Pacific's Bob Taggart. There are very good reasons for these invasions or intrusions, if you will. And really, ultimately, society is going to determine whether this, this inconvenience or intrusion of drug testing is important enough to be included in those invasions that we feel are necessary. President Reagan has already mandated that drug testing occur among federal workers. But the least likely federal employees to use drugs, you'd think, are the air traffic controllers because of all the security and monitoring that's already in place at these control centers. Thank you, Burbank Altimeter 3007. It takes a special edge to be a controller to have 3,000 lives in your hands most of the time and to face the possibility of a mid-air at any time. It takes a lot of trust between controllers. Such professionals are so self-disciplined that even too much coffee can be considered a no-no. Yet supervisors at the Palmdale, California Center suspected that some might be using drugs during their off-duty hours. 34 of the 400 employees here were put under investigation in August. One of those investigated, Dennis Cottle, said what happened seemed more like a police state interrogation than an inquiry. They asked questions, who have you slept with in the last two years? Uh, where have you lived? You know, in just really bizarre questions, anything they could to intimidate people. And they said that the uh, Miranda rights didn't apply, Fifth Amendment rights didn't apply. They gave us a sheet of paper saying that you have the right to remain silent, but if you do, you will be fired. Ron Tovar was another controller who was investigated. I was taken back to the, at the bathroom within the medical office and with a flight surgeon, the regional flight surgeon standing right behind me was told to pee into a bottle with him observing right behind or actually to the side of me. Well, uh, there were women involved in this test as well, correct? From what I've been told, they also had someone standing behind them, most likely a nurse standing right beside them as they also urinated into the uh, into the cup we've talked to lawyers now constitutional violation lawyers that say that it will be extremely hard or impossible to stop this movement i think they finally realize that the only way to stop drug use in the country is to get people where their wallets are that's because in some cases employees can lose their jobs if they fail the drug tests or as in the case of those who didn't pass the test at palmdale rehabilitation can be costly and they're demanding a 30-day in-house rehabilitation program, and the employees are expected to pay the $12,000 for it. So in essence, it's a 30-day jail term with a $12,000 fine. This is leading to what I consider to be the next epidemic in America, which has already started, and that's test abuse. Dr. Ronald Siegel is a nationally known psychologist from UCLA who treats people who have drug problems. He says that the drug testing is not reliable. Let me put it to you this way. Would you want your doctor making a decision to operate on you on the basis of a single blood or urine test? Now, most people in America, I hope, would be horrified by that thought. And yet, every day in America, we are operating on our workers. We are severing them from their jobs and their livelihood and sometimes their freedom on the basis of a single chemical test. With so much riding on that one single test, you'd be surprised at the number of things that can go wrong. Once you turn over your sample and it's out of your control, the problems can begin. For example, in just getting the sample into the mail and to the lab, one of the things that's been known to happen can be disastrous. It's called sample switch up. Sample switch up means that you have taken two samples and put the wrong labels on them. You've switched, a, you've switched them around. The potential being that a donor who gave a negative sample is, is now got his label on a sample that's positive. 
and therein lies, the, therein lies the nightmare. Ted Schultz is a vice president at CompuChem Laboratory in North Carolina. The lab is highly respected and is the only civilian laboratory certified to do testing for the Department of Defense. But Schultz says that in other labs, even if sample switch-up isn't a problem, the next thing that could go wrong with your urine sample is a quirk in the inexpensive chemical test that is most widely used. You are uh, using an antibody to recognize the drug. The problem lies in the fact that the antibody uh, may be reacting to something besides the, the drug molecule that you're looking for. Well, for example, if a person is taking the uh, non-prescription drug, Advil, uh, is, that, is there a possibility it could be confused for a non-legal drug? Uh, there, there, that possibility exists. Yeah, what about uh, contact? Well, contact, there's no question about it, that this will give you a positive reading on the amphetamine, and you have to go on for an additional test. So all too often, I think companies are, you know, are using this as being their sole uh, uh, a source of information. In other words, if you have taken common over-the-counter medications like Advil and Nuprin, your test could register positive for marijuana use. Or if you'd used Contact or Sudafed, your test could show up as amphetamine. There is a foolproof method of checking, another more sophisticated test costing upwards of $100 per sample, something not every company may want to pay. And because the employee has no access to or control over his urine sample once the company takes it, the employee can't on his own get the independent verification the more sophisticated test would provide. Southern Pacific stands behind the test it gave to Alan Pettigrew, but Pettigrew thinks his asthma medication may have confused the test. And what about Ron Tavor's drug test? I looked at it as a means of proving my innocence. That was the only reason that I finally agreed to take the test, is to show that I was innocent of any drug abuse. But to his surprise, the results were positive. Tavor believes the Advil he was taking may have influenced his test result. Still, the FAA may require him to seek rehabilitation at his own expense. As for Dennis Cottle, his came up negative but merely the fact that he was tested has cast a stigma. The negative test result was little consolation. A lot of people are afraid to talk me, to me now because they don't want to be associated with anybody that might have something to do with drugs. Even though your test came back negative? Even though it came back negative. They, uh, they assume that we're all guilty and they don't want anything to do with us. Successful executives count on Zenith's IBM-compatible PCs, even when the road to the corner office means taking the office on the road. Zenith. Quality. When you care about people, nothing's too good, which is why I've been making homemade soup for years. But I've discovered a delicious soup from Campbell's called Home Cooking. Homemade style broth with tender chicken, celery, and carrots and noodles. It's the closest thing to my own which is important, because if you love someone, a little thing like soup isn't a little thing. Home cooking, I taste so close to home. You know, the engineers who designed this Renault Alliance did a beautiful job of taming the small car. And then they got, well, reckless. The result is this guy, the Renault GTA. Everything from GTA's wheels and tires to the engine has been specifically designed for performance. So if you want something a little more stimulating than the family wheels, come on, just say you got a little restless too. Good morning, Mr. Fields. Diagnosis, congestion, runny nose, sneezing, ah, oh, that cold. No kidding. Introducing the future of cold and allergy relief. New Contact 12-hour caplets. So advanced, it helps stop the runny nose Sudafed can't and works twice as long as Actifed tablets. New 12-hour caplets. Perhaps nothing will ever beat Contact's relief. You're welcome. Until there's a cure, there's Contact. Now there's a full-featured camcorder this small that replays through your TV or your VCR. 
Zenith Compact VHS. It's in a league by itself. Zenith. Quality. Wednesday on Highway to Heaven. We are not adopting him. How will Jonathan help a troubled family find love? Then on Give Me a Break, when Nell heads for the Big Apple, there's romance in the air. Oh, I just love it. And it's the season premiere of You Again. Yes, yes, yes it is. And Matt lets it all hang out. Come home Wednesday. Wednesday on St. Elsewhere. You can't go on operating. Dr. Craig, an injured hand, a delicate operation. I can't, I can't do it. Wednesday. The insanity defense. It's a defense that's rarely used, but it's always controversial. It was the defense John Hinckley used when he shot President Reagan. We decided we would take a look at the insanity defense after we learned of a police officer in Allentown, Pennsylvania, charged with the murder of a former girlfriend. And a jury found him not guilty by reason of insanity. It was a verdict that came as a shock to many in Allentown. A shock involving crime and punishment. No one, no one on God's earth, no one other than God can say with any degree of certainty that Raymond Fossinger was insane at the time he pulled the trigger. No one. These are members of the Allentown Police Force, angry because they believe a fellow officer has gotten away with murder. We believe in you take someone's life that way, illegally, not in self-defense or that, but if you take a life, you should be punished for that. Uh, don't tell me it was because of drugs, because of drinking, because of temporary insanity, because I was blinded by the light, whatever. Don't tell me that. You did it. Hey. The man these officers are talking about is Ray Fassinger, a 20-year veteran of their police force, a free man today because of the insanity defense. Fassinger was charged last year with the murder of Pam Smith, his one-time girlfriend. A murder he said from the start he had no memory of committing. Do you believe that you shot Pam Smith now? No. You still don't believe you did? Despite any sort of evidence? I don't believe it. 10 for unit 72. It all began here at the communication center of the Allentown Police Station on the evening of March 2nd, 1985. A call came in from Tara, Pam Smith's 14-year-old daughter. Downtown emergency. Oh, my mom was just shot. Just shot? Yeah. Okay, well, what happened? Um, she was shot. I'm just a little scared. Okay, how was she shot? By whom? By Fassinger. Captain of Detectives John Stefanik, one of the first on the scene, questioned the young girl. She told him she had come out of the house after hearing a loud noise. When she came out, she saw and heard her mother and Ray Fassinger down the lawn between that tree and that bush. And they were struggling, and he was holding her by the arm. And at that point, they were struggling. And she yelled, what's happening? What's going on? Uh, Ray Fassinger at that time yelled, it's all right. Go in the house. Go back in the house. And they were struggling yet. And Tara started to back up towards the door, uh, scared. And at that point, she heard and saw a shot and a flash. And she then saw her mother bend over. She saw the flash and the shot, heard the shot, and her mother went down, as you're doing, and she turned and ran into the house, picked up the phone, dialed the police. Ray Fessinger was caught by police driving away a few blocks from Pam Smith's house. He was taken to police headquarters, and later that night, after Pam Smith died, he was charged with murder. When you first saw Ray Fessinger, what condition was he in? When I first entered the police headquarters, Ray Fatzinger was in the bottom of a cement cell rolled up in a fetal position, unconscious. Attorney John Carroll was called into the case by one of Fatzinger's fellow officers that night. He says when Fatzinger became more coherent about an hour later, he tried to explain to him that he was being charged with murder. His responses to me at that time weren't really responses to my statements or questions. His concern was basically over the fact that I didn't understand. They had taken his shoes, they had taken him, his belt, and they were treating him like a common criminal. Couldn't that have been convenient amnesia? He would have received an Emmy or an Academy Award if he was able to pull that off on me. Do you remember going to Pam Smith's house? No. Do you remember driving to her house at no. all? Do you remember being at Pam Smith's house? No. You don't have any recollection of being at Pam Smith's house the night of the murder? None whatsoever. Carolee ordered up a series of tests. 
Blood and urine tests revealed that Fatzinger had been drinking that night and taking the prescription drug Darvocet for chest pain. Other tests showed some abnormalities in his brain. Take a deep breath, Ray. To try to get him to recall what happened, Carolee also had him hypnotized, though the jury was never permitted to see this videotape of the session. Even under deep hypnosis, though, Fatzinger did not remember anything from a few hours before the murder to days after. Psychiatrist Dr. Robert Sadoff, hired by defense attorney Carolee, concluded that Fatzinger was in an altered state the night of the murder. My testimony was that because of his altered state, he could not have clearly known the nature and quality of his act or known that what he was doing was wrong in a conscious, alert, responsible state. And the altered state was brought on to him, not by his own voluntariness, but because he had early brain damage, depression, which is a mental illness, and the inclusion of alcohol, which he was using to medicate himself because of his severe chest pain, and the Darvocet. Ray Fassinger pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. He did not testify in his own defense. Nor would his attorney allow him to be evaluated by the psychiatrist for the state. Pennsylvania law allows defendants to refuse to be examined by the prosecution's psychiatrist. Do you believe that he was insane at the time? No, I do not. Bill Platt is the district attorney for Lehigh County. He prosecuted Fatzinger and says there is a much more obvious reason for Fatzinger's altered state that night. You think this is a case of Ray Fatzinger simply being drunk instead of insane? At the best, he was drunk. Uh, he certainly was not uh, insane in any legal sense or in any, any common sense, sense in my view. How many did you have, do you think, that day? What I could remember is the ones I told you. I had two or three in the morning. I had maybe five, six in the afternoon. That's nine. And, uh, say, 15. Are you an alcoholic? I don't believe so, no. An alcoholic wakes up in the morning. The first thing they do uh, for breakfast is have a drink. And That's what you did that morning. No, I had, I had a couple cups of coffee and a couple drinks. Some of the key witnesses against Fatzinger in the case were longtime colleagues on the Allentown Police Force, many of whom had seen him on the night of the arrest and testified that while he might have been drunk, he knew what he was doing. The officers who were guarding him in the holding cell testified he asked questions relating to the murder. Sergeant Richard Supan told us what sort of things Fatzinger said to the guards. Some of the things were, how is Pam doing? How's the kid? And of course the kid meaning the witness, the main witness in the case, uh, the witness that allegedly saw the shot fired. And then it went to uh, more or less a, a situation where, where that, uh, hey, she deserved what she got, or, you know, she took me for $85,000 in a house. This is where Ray Fassinger stood trial this past June. The prosecution asked for a guilty verdict, murder in the first degree, charging he shot Pam Smith and knew what he was doing. The defense asked the jury for a not guilty verdict, claiming the medical and psychiatric evidence showed that he did not know right from wrong the night of the murder. The jury deliberated for two days and came back with a verdict, not guilty by reason of insanity. What was your initial reaction when the jury came back with a verdict? Surprise and shock, uh, I would say. Uh, yes, that would be it, surprise and shock. Judge David Mellenberg presided over the trial. He says he was convinced that Fatzinger was sane. Judge Mellenberg, do you think that justice was served in this case? No. But we live in an imperfect society, and uh, this will happen in our system, and it does happen. Do you think Ray Fatzinger got away with murder? Yes. Yes. But the case didn't end with Fatzinger's acquittal. Judge Mellenberg immediately sent him to Allentown State Hospital for evaluation, and the doctors there came back with yet another verdict. If Fatzinger was insane at the time of the murder, he certainly wasn't anymore. Based on the doctor's report, Judge Mellenberg said he had no choice but to order his release. Pam Smith's father was outraged. Do you think Ray Fatzinger got away with murder? Certainly he did. He knows it and everybody else knows it. Losing my sister is bad enough. It's just terrible, losing a member of your family, especially in a way like this, being murdered, you know. But 
it hurts even more to know that this man is out on the street. Um, it, it's just, it's really devastating. District Attorney Platt thinks the jury believed Fussinger shot Pam Smith, but felt sorry for him and found the insanity plea as a way out. Ray Fassinger, during the course of this trial, appeared to be a man 20 years older than his age. He looked like a beaten man. They heard about his career as a police officer, uh, and there was a certain amount of sympathy that was obviously generated uh, for him during the course of the trial. And I think they used the insanity device as a device to avoid a difficult decision that they otherwise would have had to make. But if the jury felt sympathy for Fassinger, his fellow officers certainly didn't. There's a person dead. There's a person dead at the instrumentality of another human being. For all intents and purposes, that human being has walked away from it. What about the victim? Do you think it's conceivable, since you know Ray Fassinger, that he could have suddenly become temporarily insane and then sane again? No, th th this is the thing that bothers me. You're a police officer, in his case, for 19 years and eight months. You're constantly reminded of right from wrong, right from wrong. Don't do this, do that. And it's tough for me to comprehend a man with that kind of background to suddenly snap like that and then everything's okay again. It's tough for me to comprehend that. Then what was it? In my mind, uh, it was... In my mind, it was a sham. But if it was a sham, it didn't end there. For no sooner had Fassinger been released than he showed up for work and asked for his job and back pay for the year and a half he was in jail awaiting trial. His fellow officers, appalled, began moves to throw him out of their police union. Aren't you all being too tough on Ray Fassinger? No, no. We're not tough on Ray Fassinger. We're, on, we're tough on anybody that kills anybody. We're tough on everybody. That's our job, and that's what we're here to do. No matter if it's a cop, president of the United States, a state senator, a congressman, we're here to prosecute, and that's what we do. I guess the question you might ask was, wasn't Ray Fassinger tough on Pam Smith? As for Ray Fassinger, he was driven off the police force and out of the union, but he's still fighting for his back pay. He did, however, get his pension from the city. As for the trial, he feels justice has prevailed because he doesn't believe he killed Pam Smith. When we return in a moment or two, a heart attack victim gets a new lease on life thanks to some high-tech medicine and some fuming over a toxic waste plant in Louisiana. for you with a Toyota 4x4 Turbo, the only gas turbo, the turbo tough enough to take you where you want to go. Looking out for number one. Looking out for you has made Toyota number one in compact truck sales and number one in truck satisfaction. Who could ask for anything more? Toyota. I work in a restaurant and I'm always around tempting food. We have great desserts. So it's hard for me not to eat. But Dexatrim gives me the extra help I need, so I don't take a spoonful here and a bite there. Dexatrim just grabs hold of my appetite, so my diet works. Now my customers say, how can you work here and stay so thin? Dexatrim people, they not only try to lose weight, they succeed. killed Colonel Morrison. I helped him do it. It was all three of us. Will it be prison or the firing squad? Then on Miami Vice. Yeah! G. Gordon Liddy targets Crockett for death. Now that the dreaming's over, come to where the action is. Come home Friday. The savings are adding up on America's best-selling truck line during Ford Truck Week. First, get low 2.9% financing on any new manual transmission Ford pickup. Or second, take your choice of $600 cash back direct from Ford. Third, add a factory option package and save almost $1,900. And fourth, get additional savings with your Ford dealer's own discount. So remember, get 2.9% financing on a tough manual transmission full-size pickup or a sporty compact Ranger pickup. Now during Ford Truck Week. From Channel 4, this is a news update. Here is Dimitria Kaladimos.
coming up tonight on the scene at 10, a citizens group fighting airport noise now has a new complaint. Statistics on school violence seem to tell two different stories. Bowling Green police say they're not giving up yet. And a look at where you can and can't light up as our series continues. Now this. Eyes, source of power. Shiseido, source of color. Kastner Knot, the best of beauty awaits you. 78 degrees in Nashville. More news later on the scene at 10. This has been a news update brought to you by Kastner Knot. The best of beauty awaits you. Here is what so many of us dread, and dread rightfully. A sudden chest pain and an ordinary day turned into a struggle for life. The diagnosis? Heart attack. The prognosis? It all depends. Our audience tonight probably numbers between 15 and 16 million viewers. Statistically, that means 101,000 will suffer heart attacks in the coming year, and nearly 38,000 will die. The good news is that the medical wonder workers are, in fact, working wonders. Our next report tonight is about a man in Jackson, Michigan, who without one of those new wonders might very well have died. His life could have gone one way or the other in a matter of just a few heartbeats. It felt like somebody had, that was in my chest tried to get out and rip it out. And my arms started aching. It felt like somebody grabbed the meat underneath it and just started peeling it off. His name is Donald Brown. He's 41. He's a high school groundskeeper in Jackson, Michigan. He's a heavy smoker. He's in the emergency room at Foot Hospital because an hour ago at 4.50 p.m., he began to have a heart attack. He admitted he was scared. The pain was unbearable, he said, but then the doctor brought him some hope. The doctor explained to me that they had a new drug, EPA, that they could administer and help to prevent a heart attack. TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, an experimental medication that dissolves blood clots. But the experiment in Michigan is being run by the University Hospital over in Ann Arbor, 42 miles away. At 6.50 p.m., the medical team from the University of Michigan landed in the foot parking lot, and with them they brought in a brown paper lunch bag, TPA. Which way? The next thing I really remember is uh, there was people there from Ann Arbor. There was a nurse, and she was changing the IVs and putting the little IVs, getting me ready to go in the helicopter. Uh, they'd give me so much medication, I didn't even... I wasn't even worried about the helicopter ride. We're going ready to go for a ride. Bye. You ready? But at 7.22 p.m., just as the helicopter was ready for takeoff, Don Brown's heartbeat began to run away. Uh, he just had a run of VT. Doctors call it VT, short for ventricular tachycardia, which meant Don Brown's heart had started beating very fast. But it quickly quieted down, which meant the experimental medicine had done its job. It had broken up the clot, allowing fresh blood to flow again. Is your pain better? Yeah. Even before Don Brown had reached University Hospital in Ann Arbor, his heart attack was ending. University Hospital, this is Survival Flight 1, you happy? Survival Flight 1, copy, copy loud and clear, University Go ahead. Uh, Please advise Cath Lab that when we loaded into the helicopter, the patient did have a short run of VTAC to require any further information. That's negative. Survival Flight 1 will be standing by. Cath Lab is ready. This is Dr. Eric Topol, 32 years old, a cardiologist and professor at the Michigan Medical School. Hey, there we go. Hang in there. You're going to do just great, okay? We're going to get you home before you know it. What I'd like you to do, I have a consent form that I'd like you to sign here. We're going to rock and roll here. Yeah. All we need is the groin to be shaved. Okay, Mr. Brown, what we're going to be doing now is taking some pictures of the arteries, okay? 5,000. 5,000 heparins in? Yeah. He is about to push a catheter, or thin tube, through Don Brown's leg artery into his heart cavity, flood it with dye, and then photograph the damage. Okay, hang in there. Oh, hang in. Dr. Topol, what is a heart attack? 
Well, it's a very simple term that refers to the death of some of the heart tissue or the heart muscle. What causes the death? Well, there are three main arteries that supply the heart muscle. And when one of these arteries loses its blood supply, its blood supply is just cut off. This leads to a lack of oxygen and nutrients into the heart muscle. The X-ray films taken that night at University Hospital showed that Don Brown's arteries, like those of millions of other Americans, were lined with a fatty substance called plaque. We're right in this spot. We think that the plaque, which is cholesterol material, basically developed a crack in it. And at that point, a blood clot formed. Under the microscope, a blood clot is a tangle of fibers and blood cells. When those clots clog the arterial plumbing, doctors need some sort of biochemical Drano. Tissue plasminogen activator. It's actually a human enzyme that you and I and everyone have a small quantity of in the bloodstream. The problem is there isn't enough natural TPA in the body to cope quickly with a big blood clot. So TPA is being manufactured by the Genentech Pharmaceutical Company in San Francisco. The gene splicers at Genentech have isolated the gene making TPA and have transplanted it from human cells into hamster cells. The hamster cells are turning out the enzyme in quantity now and Genentech is giving it free to the 40 hospitals which are testing it. If approved by the Food and Drug Administration, an injection of TPA will probably cost about $2,000. Don Brown became one of only 2,100 people to be treated with TPA. At 8.30 that night, just three hours, 40 minutes after the attack began, Dr. Topol got his first look at the results. All right. Take a nice deep breath now. Take a deep breath and hold it. Inject. Oh, geez, that's fantastic. Fantastic. All right. Breathe away. Your heart's normal, okay? We can't even find any abnormality. Where's Mrs. Brown? Right here. Hi, I'm Dr. Topol. Everything went beautifully. Okay, Good. that's the most important thing. He did great. Uh, he got this medicine, this TPA, and about 30 minutes later, just as he was getting on the helicopter, it opened up the artery, and his pain went away almost completely. Can I just have his wife see him for just a sec? I'm all right now. Mm -hmm. Feel better? Love you. I love you too. Dr. Topol and Dr. Alan Langberg poured over Don Brown's artery x-rays like football coaches screening Saturday's game films. And I suspect that if, if we had done nothing, that the entire inferior wall would have been dead. Yeah. Yeah. And instead, all he's left with is, a, at best, a meager um, area of, um, of abnormality. Right. 24 hours after his heart attack, Don Brown was out of intensive care. 72 hours after the attack, he was on a treadmill, passing his stress test. He could have been discharged in three days, but the guidelines for the TPA experiment required him to stay a week. It's all part of cardiology's new aggressive approach to heart attacks. Dr. Eugene Brownwald, professor of cardiology and chief of medicine at Harvard, remembers the old approach when he was an intern in the early 1950s. The entire philosophy has changed. I think that, that uh, when I trained, uh, the approach to treating a victim of a heart attack was let the patient rest in bed until the scar heals. Is the patient ready to sit up in bed on the eighth day or the tenth day? And that's what was discussed. Dr. Brownwall is director of the largest TPA study, which will involve about 4,000 patients and is funded by the National Institutes of Health. He sees TPA as a powerful weapon, but... It's a two-edged sword. If you're going to have a very potent drug that's going to dissolve uh, bad clots, clots in your coronary vessels, it may also dissolve good clots and break into a hemorrhage. So far, however, bleeding complications have shown up in less than 1% of TPA patients. Yeah. I think there still is a way to go and uh, there still will be additional and ultimately even better drugs of this type. But I think uh, of TPA uh, in the treatment of heart attacks, analogous to the development of penicillin, 
in the secret of infections back in the 1940s. Well, that's major, then, isn't it? That is a very major development. I'm in good shape right now. I'm as good a shape now as I was before I had the heart attack. Really? My feeling. Uh -huh. I don't feel like I had a heart attack. I don't feel like anything. I feel like I'm ready to go back to work. I'm ready to do whatever goes with life. But the whole thing seems so quick and easy, and you seem so undamaged that I just wonder whether you think that nobody can get to you, that you're really invincible. I was real lucky. It's like you got a second chance. What have they told you to do so you won't have another heart attack? Well, they told me I smoked. You did? About three packs a day. Three? And I haven't smoked since. How about your wife? Does she smoke? She's still smoking a little bit, and uh, they told me to watch cholesterol a little. My cholesterol is a little high. Uh, they want me to do a little exercise. He said take off about 10 pounds. Okay, so you've stopped smoking. Have you taken off 10 pounds? No. <laughs> Are you exercising regularly? Yes, I'm walking every day. If you get a second chance in something, you should do it the right way the second time. I'll pitch. So TPA, the product of genetic engineering, bought Don Brown's doctors some time. It bought Don Brown a lifetime. It put his heart back together the way it was. No better, no worse. Uh oh, uh oh, back up. It didn't make it any easier for him to stop smoking or lose weight. But it did mean that four weeks after he thought he might die, he was playing softball with his son. Just a week ago, Don Brown took and passed his final stress test on the treadmill, and the next day he went back to work at Jackson High School. You're going down a road behind the wheel of a new Dodge Dakota. the first true mid-size pickup ever made. Inside, room for three. This automation, advanced equipment with an extraordinary concept. The easier, the better. The Panasonic Modular Electronic Typewriter lets you customize for your specific needs. Expand its memory, add a character display, over a thousand ways to make your work easier. Panasonic modular typewriters. Like our copiers, computers, and peripherals, the easier the better. Panasonic office automation. I have oil effects. Kids are born stain makers. Ups. So moms need the stain lifter. Ooh. A L L. How does it work? All goes right to the stain and just lifts it away. For my little stain makers. I get the stain lifter. Whoa! Ow, ow. It's the stain lifter. All now with more cleaning power. Thursday on Cheers, can Diane make Sam change his mind about marriage, or has he found another woman? Sam! And on the season premiere of the Emmy-winning Night Courts. Hi again! It's the case of the tongue-tied dummy. Then, the seventh season, the special premiere, the unforgettable Hill Street Blues. Take a poor street hustler. Is there a problem, officers? And a rich, fat cat. Pork bellies. I knew it. And put them in each other's shoes. This kind of thing happens to me every week. <laughs> and you've got Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd trading places. A network premiere movie Sunday. <laughs> For years now, people have been living in the shadow of a toxic waste processing plant near Baton Rouge, Louisiana living in its shadow and fearing the consequences. Then along came Pat Norton, a young woman who might not seem at first glance like a mighty opponent, but a mighty opponent she's turned out to be. As Lucky Severson reports, she's turned what was a smoldering problem into a burning issue. <laughs> okay. Ever since the governor appointed her director of environmental quality, Pat Norton has been setting off alarms all over the state of Louisiana. It said the governor got a lot more than he bargained for. 
Who would have ever thought that this young backpacker who carries elderberries in her car to ward off Cajun fleas would take her job so seriously? This is what I come home from work with. Thank you for my briefcase. I hope y'all don't use this. That she would take on one of the country's most powerful hazardous waste disposal companies and close down its Louisiana operation. But she did. Who'd ever dreamed that this 32-year-old lawyer and mother of one who loves the outdoors would stir up such a hornet's nest? I consider myself to be uh, pretty innocent politically, but I think in this state, innocence is probably the best politics. I love this state, and I love the environment, and I want to be able to live here the rest of my life and want to raise my kids here. And that's the only reason I'm in this job. She says she was just doing her job when she closed down this plant operated by Rollins Environmental Services in August 1985. Rollins is one of the leading companies in the hazardous waste disposal business. What they do here is bury, burn, or treat some of the most deadly waste in the country, the kind that can kill. Rollins admits that in the past, the company has had some problems. In 1971, Rollins mixed hazardous waste and crude oil together and shipped it to an oil refinery. The refinery blew up. In 1974, Rollins was held responsible for spilling waste onto a neighboring ranch. 20 cattle were killed. In the last five years, Rollins has been cited for 109 violations of Louisiana environmental regulations. The company moved into the neighborhood about 15 years ago, right across the street from the poor sharecropper's town of Alson. People have been complaining about gut-wrenching stench and health problems ever since. Man, oh, that stinky odor. Your eyes be burning. You just get strangled and cough and gang, vomit and do everything. You talking about sick. A doctor says fumes from the Rollins plant contributed to the death of Leon Johnson's wife. And he and about 800 of the plant's neighbors have joined together and sued Rollins for polluting their air with dangerous chemicals. People shouldn't have to live with that. And any, any company that has any conscience at all would be very interested in trying to solve that problem. And Rollins has been given six years to solve it, and they haven't solved it. And that does make me angry. Before Pat Norton came along, it seemed that hardly anyone ever got angry. For years, Louisiana has enticed oil, gas, and chemical companies with an unwritten understanding that it would look the other way when it came to enforcing environmental protection laws. Now the state is sitting on an ecological time bomb. People are afraid, and so is Pat Norton. She says when she said about actually enforcing the law, she had the most difficult time with Rollins. Rollins has more complaints and more enforcement actions taken against them in a time span of since this agency's been in existence than any other company. She says she never would have closed Rollins if it hadn't been for the people of Alson. It was the night the smells got so bad at the Mount Bethel Baptist Church. The Reverend Willie Fontenot's eyes were watering so much he couldn't finish his sermon. At that particular time, I've had a terrible headache, and I couldn't shout like I wanted. I couldn't uh, holler like I wanted, uh, you know, and tell these sinner men and sinner women, come on to Christ. So the Reverend sent the sinner people home that August night, and Pat Norton went out to the plant. The incinerator was, was out of control and was causing uh, serious problems of blowing out black smoke. But the other thing that concerned me was that the company intended to keep running it anyway. When she closed Rollins, Pat Norton was an instant hero to some people, even at the grocery store. You're going to get Rollins, oh yeah. yeah. Right on, yeah. I hope you get them good. Get them good. <laughs> for, the, for the environment, man, good. Yeah, right on. For my lungs. <laughs> really? My baby's lungs, yeah. For the past year, the plant has been back in business, while Rollins lawyers argued against the state that it should stay in business. Why? There was no significant environmental law violation on the, on, on, during the upset of the 5th of August. All this poppycock about uh, the incinerator room being out of control and, uh, and the, 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 the control room being understaffed and that kind of thing is just not so. At a hearing this summer, Rollins' lawyers did more than defend the company. They attacked Pat Norton, charging that she was a regulator run amok. They said that because of the way she handled the plant's closing, Rollins' stock took a tumble. The company sued Pat Norton personally for over $100 million. And the lady with the elderberries couldn't believe what hit her. They've just unleashed uh, almost a nuclear war against me personally. To wage its war, Rollins hired Washington lawyer Dan Burt. 
a self-described hitman who reminds everyone that he sued CBS on behalf of General William Westmoreland. No expense has been spared, including the cost of the camera and cameraman who recorded our taping of this interview. Do you think Pat Norton has been picking on Rollins? I don't think there's any question that uh, she's not dealt uh, fairly and appropriately in a uh, reasoned uh, fashion with the company as required by law. All of that to me is just simply uh, harassment. It's meant to intimidate. It's meant to try to put the department in a position where it's more trouble than it's worth and we'll just back off and drop the case. She was required to submit to questioning by Burt and other company lawyers on seven separate occasions. Eventually, it dawned on her that she was on trial as much as Rollins. Sorry, I have one, one request to make. I would prefer, Ms. Norton, if you'd address counsel by their last name. Please. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank Excuse you. me. Sam. Ms. Norton. Lawyer Burt offered us information about Pat Norton's sex life, and he has told people in Baton Rouge that he was brought in to get her. Oh, absolutely not. I was brought in to try and get at the truth. Lawyer Burt says Pat Norton negotiated a settlement on another matter with Rollins several years ago and was publicly criticized for being too lenient. He charges that she's had a personal vendetta against Rollins ever since. You're making a very serious charge here. Now we're going to stop this. Wait a minute. Why are we going to stop this? No. Isn't that not, not the case? No, you're not putting it right. I'm not, I may not be putting it the way court, you want me to put it. But, uh, but well, I'm I disagree. It I just, no, you're not. And you're putting... Uh, you tell me how you would put it. We believe that the actions she took weren't warranted. Uh, they were excessive. They were wrong. We said that in our pleadings. I say that to you here. According to the company's own records, the plant was having problems during the month before Pat Norton closed it. Here are some log entries from incinerator operators. July 2nd, fallout bad, going toward Alson. July 15th, the entry reads, fallout and smoke is terrible. And it says measures were taken, quote, so we can breathe. And again on July 24th, stack falling out bad. Meanwhile, the Louisiana Attorney General has asked the grand jury to investigate charges that Rollins management ordered employees to illegally tamper with the plant's incinerator so that it would burn more waste and boost profits. There is a clear record of noncompliance on many instances, knowing noncompliance continual noncompliance, and an effort to evade the law. What kind of a grade would you give Rollins as a corporate citizen, as a responsible corporate citizen? It's been a terrible corporate citizen on a scale of one to ten, about a three. Pat Norton admits that she was naive about the political fallout when she closed Rollins. Governor Edwin Edwards immediately summoned her to the mansion to work out a compromise with the company. The governor has refused to talk to us about that meeting, but at the time, he told Louisiana television viewers... I told her then, in this room, and I say again, that whatever her decision is finally made, I will support it. But I wanted her to make sure she was on solid legal grounds before she made a firm decision. Norton says the governor asked her to consider the economic impact of closing the plant, and that he asked her to back off. He said, consider the economic impact. Right, he said that, and I did, and... Uh, when you met with him one time, did he say, this will be the last friendly conversation we ever had? I don't remember. He may have. He may have. It's widely known around here that one of the senior partners in a law firm defending Rollins is also one of the governor's closest political supporters and fundraisers. But lawyer Burt fervently denies allegations that the company is politically protected. I'd like to get my hands on the lying, scurrilous suckers that make those allegations because they demean the lawyers that are involved in here. And if you want to tell me who they are, they can make them to my face and we can sue them silly. After all the talk about suits, a federal judge has dismissed Rollins' $150 million lawsuit against Pat Norton. But the company has won an important battle in what promises to be a long war. The Louisiana Supreme Court has ruled that her public statement showed that she was prejudiced against Rollins in the case. And the court removed her from presiding over the hearing to determine if the plant should stay open. The governor appointed a new hearing officer. And if it's so safe, why don't the people that own Rollins come down here and live next to it? Why don't the mealy mouth attorney they have live next door to it? People around here are watching the case closely. 
throughout the state, but particularly in Alston, a town that for years thought it had no friends. That we are standing behind Pat Norton 1,000 percent. Knowing now what you know, what you're going to go through, would you do it all over again? I would do it all over again, and I'd do it exactly the same way. I like my job. I like what I do, and my heart's really in environmental protection. I, I can't think of any other job that I'd rather do. A judge is expected to decide within the next few days if Pat Norton did the right thing. That's our broadcast for this week. See you next Tuesday. Good night. Nineteen eighty six, sponsored in part by Dodge. Performance to thrill you, looks to move you. Dodge, setting new standards of performance. Superbly equipped new breed of compact car, Dodge Shadow. With its 550 protection plan, two or four door availability, affordable price, the new Dodge Shadow is going to cast a giant shadow across America. Dodge setting new standards of performance. Friday on Miami Vice. Yeah! G. Gordon Liddy targets Crockett for death. Now that the dreaming's over, come to where the action is. Then. You got yourself a lawyer. The power. The passion. <laughs> the people. The acclaimed series premiere, L.A. Law, right after Miami Vice, Friday. On the scene at 10 tonight, the new metro airport is called illegal. Teachers wonder whether school violence is up or down. A major breakthrough is announced in U.S.-Soviet relations, and we'll look at segregation on the grounds of smoking. That's coming up next.